I'm here to work partially on a different topic, on washable computing and conventional computation. But uh, what I'm going to present here is some ongoing work. It is ongoing since uh, six, seven years, since I'm ending. This is good. So it's a, it's a, a sound uh, research line for us. Uh, uh, and it's uh, related with the, the application of Point to the to the computer. Wait, the, the laser. But oh. Okay, that's it. Oh, never mind, never mind. <laughs> so the idea is that the <coughs> shortly uh, the composition of the research work group I, I belong to, but uh, uh, basically in this topic uh, we joined two in principle uh, different fields which were statistical physics. There are so, some uh, work, well-known work uh, at this stage on the growth of all of, uh, finite, also uh, infinitesimal but uh, finite uh, perturbations in spatiotemporal systems. If you put a perturbation in a spatiotemporal system, how it evolves in time. When uh, it does become so big that uh, you, can, you can see the effect, uh, non-negligible non effects, and how this effect uh, evolves in time and in space. And uh, we apply these uh, this, uh, results to a, a a different field, which is, which is the weather forecasting one. There are some models there, which are run in, a, in an ensemble mode. They will explain later what, what, uh, what does it mean. But basically, we put perturbations in the atmospheric model, and you try to capture the uncertainty you have in the forecast uh, in, in a two, three days horizon. Uh, you capture this uncertainty. Uh, in terms of the evolution of this perturbation. Okay. So what, uh, what we did with uh, quite a good success was joining these two fields. Uh, taking the, the important concepts from the theoretical world and uh, managing them, doing some engineering and, and applying them to the uh, weather forecasting world, which uh, in principle is very different in subject topics and so on. And uh, for that, uh, we collaborated with uh, Juan Manuel López and Diego Pazo, also from the Instituto de Física de Cantabria, from the Statistical Physics Group. Uh, Diego Pazo was already here, like uh, one month ago, even with a bit, uh, bit more. He gave a seminar also with uh, some related topic, the growth of uh, infinitesimal characteristic modes, the uh, of vectors, and so on. So very briefly, the, the meteorology group in Santander, which is part of the Instituto de Física de Cantabria, is, uh, is a mixed uh, research group by uh, some people from CSIC and some people from the Department of Applied Mathematics. This was my former department eight years ago. And uh, there are, we are about uh, 20 people working in meteorology and climate, and data mining, and spatiotemporal chaos. And this link, meteorology and spatiotemporal chaos, is the one that I will uh, describe here. We, we have also spin-off uh, with uh, six people working there, so we are producing employees <laughs> in, this, in this crisis time, so it's good that we do that. So this the, the main idea is that uh, for years and years, people in the statistical physics uh, community, like you, uh, work with uh, what the, the meteorological counterparts 
called toy models. They are toy models for them, but not for us. It's a typical example, the Lorentz 96 model. It's a kind of spatiotemporal uh, dynamical system. Uh, you have here differential equations, but I is space. Typically, I takes uh, a value 40, so you have 40 coupled, let's say, or oscillators coupled in this way with a standard fossil, which is something similar to the sun, radiative uh, forcing to the atmosphere. And <coughs> uh, this is the evolution in time, space and time. Space means I here. And this is the evolution of a typical perturbation. If I put, uh, if I start evolving the same dynamical system from the same X O initial condition plus a, a small perturbation, initially the error is uh, negligible, but at uh, some time it starts growing and it becomes as large as the dynamical system itself. It saturates. It, it is a non-linear system, it's chaotic and non-linear system. So we are, we are uh, interested in uh, analyzing this, this evolution. When does it saturate, become non-negligible? Uh, this spatial structure has something to do with the growth of all these structures. And the idea is that <coughs> uh, we're interested in those topics but apply to a real world problem, to a non-toy model, which is the climate system. I will, I will tell you later which models did we use and how, how, how they run and so on. But uh, the idea is, uh, this is the spirit of the talk, from theory to operations to, to real world. How can we translate some of the theoretical results from this to an uh, operational problem giving some added value to the, to the standard operations? Okay? So, <clears throat> The, the talk, uh, I, will, I will recap on some spatiotemporal growth of errors results, very descriptive and very, very intuitive. Mm, I'm a mathematician, but uh, I do no longer mathematics, <laughs> so I have nothing to do with mathematics now, so no uh, very mathematical deep results we will now here. Okay? They are in the literature, but not here. Uh, then I will tell you about uh, weather forecasting, this ensembles idea in weather forecasting, how this relates with this. We, we introduced what we call the NVL diagram, which is a very nice, simple plot to see spatiotemporal growth. We apply this uh, NVL diagram to seasonal forecasting in a state-of-the-art uh, ensemble of operational models run in a European project a big project. And then if I have time uh, remaining, I will get into the role of different temporal scales. What, uh, what I'm going to show you up to this point <coughs> refers to just a uh, system with one scale, which is not the typical situation in Denmark, where several different scales co coexist continuously. Some conclusions. So, <coughs> the Lorentz 96 model. I already explained the, the basic features. The only, the only interesting thing remaining to say is that the, this, this model mimics the time evolution of a scalar meteorological quantity at the, for instance, the, the equator. So each of the, each of the points in the space uh, are uh, equidistant points, for instance, in the in the grid, and in, in that case, the dynamics of this system mimics, to some extent, the dynamics, the general dynamics of the atmosphere, in terms of uh, general circulation. Okay. So this, uh, for a meteorologic, uh, from a meteorological point of view, this evolution is something that has to do with the climate. Okay. So, uh, another interesting thing that uh, this model has uh, an extension to cope with different temporal or spatial, temporal or spatial scales, both, uh, and uh, the results uh, obtained here can be then extrapolated to, to a more realistic situation. So, you have all the way through to do all the analysis that, uh, that you want 
uh, using as this model. Yes, using a single model. So where, where does it come that sort of tapping that you have there? I mean, yes, I, I can. Where does it come this sort of the tapping that you have there? Where, I mean, what's the physics behind that model? Yeah, you, you need to read this paper. This <laughs> is. Is, is the coupling comes from the harmonics of the spectral equations of the atmosphere. So if you take the, the, the equations that I will show you later, and you, will, you solve it in, in the spectral space, and you truncate to 40 modes, the coupling at the first order uh, follows this, this uh, connectivity. It's inspired in the, in the evolution of the atmosphere. But it's, it's not something that can be explained in two minutes. So it's, it's, it's uh, hidden. But, uh, so this is a toy model. It's, it's inspired in the atmosphere, but has nothing to do with the atmospheric dynamics. Yeah. <coughs> but since Loren, the same Lorenz, as the seminal work in 63, uh, proposed the, the model, it is, it is something that uh, is worth it to, to look at. <coughs> Uh, so, this is again the, the growth of a uh, typical perturbation, we call delta x, the difference between the perturbed uh, trajectory minus the control trajectory, the original tra tra uh, trajectory, the difference between these two is, the, is at the initial condition at t0, and the, the amplitude of the perturbation is a parameter to be, to be analyzed. So, the idea is that when, when one <coughs> Uh, if one forget, uh, forgets about, uh, about the space, which is the, the typical thing that uh, the typical thing to be done at the first approximation, and uh, uh, one just look at the at the spatial average uh, error, this is the time of curve that uh, that you obtain, and this is what is related with the Lyapunov exponents for infinitesimal perturbations here and so. On. But the, the, this, this kind of analysis just uh, doesn't, take, doesn't take into account the, the spatial characteristics of the system. So in reality, there is an interplay between space and time. And you cannot just neglect space, average space, and do all the analysis trying to discover all what is happening there, because you lose information. So in... Uh, 98 and then in 2004, Pikoski and Politi and afterwards Lopez uh, found that if you analyze this pattern but in the logarithmic space, then the, the evolution of, of the error follows uh, is, uh, is a raw process. So it follows scaling precise power laws, which tells you how both space and time are uh, interplaying uh, according to two given exponents. So uh, broadly, you can you can extend this analysis. This uh, spatial average is this is the mean of the of the pattern, the temporal mean, and what we call v here. This is the the variance, and the variance has to do with the correlation length, the spatial correlation length which uh, is the second parameter that uh, you need to look at, the space. Okay? So this pattern evolves and the, the characteristic uh, is, uh, correlation length in space is changing. As you can see here, there is just a single point with the, with the high perturbed, uh, with the high value. Here uh, you have a mixture of, uh, here is, uh, is uh, like a, a uniform noise, but not here. Here you, you have a precise, a localized structure of the of the, per, uh, the perturbation. So basically, what what happens is that the, as as time evolves, the initial perturbation, which is random, okay, in the space, is randomly placed, starts uh, uh, gaining a spatial structure. Uh, until it gets fully localized. So, so all the all the perturbation is here in one point in, in the space, one or several. Right? It's very localized, and then uh, then lose this uh, this uh, spatial pattern again, and in the saturation regime becomes also. Uh, this is what happens. 
it gains a structure and then it loses this structure because of the, the nonlinear character. So if you analyze just the infinitesimal uh, infinitesimal uh, regime, what you have is uh, scaling laws for both the mean and the variance, for both the temporal and the spatial and the spatial growth. But if you go to the nonlinear regime, if you go to the to, to the analysis of the finite uh, perturbation, when it becomes finite, uh, then the, the the situation is very different. Uh, this the scaling law here uh, doesn't hold anymore when the when the perturbation becomes to be saturated in, in space. Due to this nonlinear characteristic of the system, it cannot grow forever, the perturbation cannot grow forever because the, the system is finite. So when the perturbation saturates locally at some point, this this linear this scaling is no longer valid and uh, you have a, you have a, this uh, this uh, result that I already told you that the the, the structure is, is uh, the system starts losing the structure and it saturates at a climatological point. So it's very brief and very tough maybe, but uh, it's more or less the this is the what what it was known uh, in 2005 2007 about the finite spatiotemporal growth of perturbation. You cannot extrapolate infinitesimal dynamics here. So this scaling is, is not holding any longer. So it, it, it only holds in the, in the infinitesimal part. So there is no theoretical result, some exponent that you can use to characterize things, but you can just think of this, uh, this diagram. If I put here the mean and here the variance, so this is the, the growth, the mean growth in time, and this this has to do with the with the spatial structure. So uh, if you start here with the in this diagram in the initial condition, the system always evolves from left to right because it's always growing. The amplitude in, in average is growing until it's saturated. Okay. But the, the spatial structure grows and then decays until it gets to the climatological fluctuation in, in, in weather forecasting time, until it goes to the saturated uh, state. So the, in, in this point, the perturbation reaches the amplitude of the system. So it's not a perturbation anymore, it's, it's just a, a, an error of the same amplitude as the system. Okay? So this is the infinitesimal growth, and this is the finite growth. And then you can uh, compare different dynamics of things but by looking at this, at this diagram. You can put different models and see how they evolve. How fast they go to the nonlinear saturation, they go to the final saturation, so on and so forth. If you compare this, these dynamics of the nonlinear system with the, with the linearized the counterpart, what you see here is a different behavior. You have the, the scaling all the way through, the saturation, and that's it. And the system keeps growing and growing because it is uh, it's not, it's unbound. Okay? So here you have saturation of the spatial structure and then saturation due to the nonlinearity. Okay. okay. <clears throat> uh, once we have this... Uh, this, this uh, for us, this uh, diagram is a, like a fingerprint of the system dynamics. Each system evolves differently on this diagram, and the, dia the, the, the diagram is related with the intrinsic properties of the system, of the, the, the spatial temporal dynamics level. So, for instance, <coughs> we can. Uh, This is the typical behavior <coughs> if we start with a random, imagine we start with a random per perturbation. Uh, the, the random perturbation has no spatial structure, so we are here at the bottom of the, of the V uh, axis. And as the perturbation grows, this gain, gain, gain structure until it saturates and then fully saturates. Okay? But imagine that you perturb the initial condition with an error which is not random. It's an error which is flow compatible. 
So imagine that, that, that you take as, as, as the error the, the orbit trajectory point but for scale to a, to a given value. Okay? So in, in that case, the, the system, the flow, is compatible with the trajectory, with the vector and the initial trajectory. In that case, you, you have an initial structure. And this initial structure, sorry, forget about this. You have an initial structure, which is destroyed by, by the system. I'm going too fast, step, step by step. I, imagine you start with this flow uh, assimilated or flow compatible uh, perturbation. So you have a structure which is keep all the way through to the nonlinear saturation and then the full saturation. But imagine that you now take an, an initial condition which is given by the system, but in a different time. It's not flow dependent. It's not random. It has some spatial structure, which is, is compatible with the system structure, but it's not flow uh, uh, assimilated. So you start with this spatial structure, which is destroyed by the system because it's not, it's not uh, in, the, in the right time. Okay? And then you have this behavior here. So this fingerprint allows you to look at the, at the properties of the system itself in this part, but also at the properties of the initial condition you use for the perturbation. So you, you can look at both things. How is the initial perturbation that you put, which structure is there, and uh, then this, this goes upper or, or, or not depending on the dynamical properties of the system. It's a very nice diagram to show the, the properties. Okay. So uh, you have information in the in the web on the papers that you can follow these these results. And now this is the theoretical stuff to say. And how uh, how is the, the system that we use for the application? Is the is the climatic system? So. <coughs> Very simple stated, uh, the, climat the climatic system is the union of five components, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, mainly the ocean, cryosphere, the, the ice, and also the soil, the, 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 the ground. There are processes in all those uh, systems that have to do with the climate. So uh, the atmosphere is the, is the well-known component. The most popular one, uh, more than 50 years of research done in this field, then the ocean, and uh, these are more recent ones. Okay. And uh, this, uh, this system is, is driven by a forcing which is uh, natural, the solar radiation and also volcanoes and things like that. The volcanoes put the uh, aerosols in, in the atmosphere and it is, has to do with the radiation that comes into, into place and so on. And uh, also uh, human, human forces. Uh, this is the climate change, anthropogenic uh, cl climate change analysis signal and so on. This is the, the trendy, no, no longer, but the, the trendy topic in the last two decades or so. So what what uh, what they do with the atmosphere, for instance, they put all the all the processes that uh, are important that uh, play an important role at the scale that you are solving the equations, okay, at a global scale, and, uh, and you obtain some equations that uh, the, the equations are very simple: are conservation laws, thermodynamics, and uh, momentum, uh, so on, just classical stuff. But there are some ingredients which are the parameterizations uh, to say the processes that you don't explicitly uh, analytically uh, uh, resolve at, uh, at a small scale uh, cannot be avoided. You, you have to do some statistics with that in order to, in order to keep, uh, to preserve the, for instance, the tolerance. Okay? So all models, state-of-the-art models are uh, some standard numerics some standard physics, all models have the same equations, but different parameterizations. Some of them uh, 
take into account the water content vapor in the atmosphere in different ways. When they precipitate, when they form clouds and drops of water with size, a lot of, a lot of uh, statistics uh, inside this problem. So the models are physics plus parameterizations, and this is the hard, the hard uh, component. So there is an uncertainty there. The uncertainty is in the parameterization, not in the physics. Okay, so <coughs> with that uh, equations, with that parameterizations, the climate community uh, achieved running stable models for uh, for centuries. So this is a model, a state-of-the-art model, with a typical resolution of 300 kilometers. And what, what you see here is the numerical the numerical integration. This is January 4th, 5th e hour. The, the integration step is an hour. And this runs for 1,000 years. Uh, with uh, this, this is the whole globe. Uh, different vertical layers in the atmosphere, typically 63 to 120. So it's a lot of computation uh, to be done here. And the, the model is quite realistic. If you look at the... Also, there are many uncertainties in the, and many limitations and problems in the climate uh, modeling community. Uh, they did uh, a very good job. If you see here, white is, uh, is uh, water and uh, and uh, this uh, orange is uh, precipitation. This, in this case, can be bubble or solid water, and this is rain. So if you look here, the storm track in the Atlantic is quite realistic, how the storms get to the <coughs> north of the Iberian Peninsula. If you see here, we have fronts not in Sevilla. <laughs> and the, the, in the Mediterranean, you cannot see most of them. So, at a regional scale, by regional here I mean continental scale, these models do a very good job. They have many limitations, but do a, a very good job. In terms of climatology, in terms of representing the, the synoptic, the global properties of the, of the climate system. Uh, so, uh, this, you expect to have special temperatures from this model. Why do you integrate for thousands of years? I, 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 I tell you in a moment. So, <coughs> okay, this. What, uh, what do we do, or do they do, depending on, with these models? Uh, there are many, many kinds of prediction in meteorology, and the, this is the response to, the, to, your, to your question. The, the most typical one, which is uh, the one that you have in mind, is the short range weather forecasting. So you have an initial condition that you obtain assimilating all the observations that are are taken globally with instruments, satellites, planes, so on. You put all together and assimilate them into the model. So you have the assimilations in the model space, initial condition, and you run the model. If you run the model up to up to, this is January, February, March, if you run the model up to 15 days, this is what is called the short to medium range weather forecast. And this is the, the horizon of deterministic predictability. So you can't go longer than that with the deterministic prediction. Okay? So <coughs> there is another there is another type of prediction, which is the monthly one. Uh, let's go to the seasonal. A different type of prediction is the seasonal one. In the seasonal one, you have exactly the same. You start the model, but you run it for a long period, and you can analyze what happens, like one year, one season, two seasons, uh, three seasons, five. So in, in, the, in the range of a year. And in this case, the model is not an atmospheric model. It's a, a, a copper atmospheric oceanic model. So the, the predictability here comes from the ocean not from the atmosphere. So this is the typical horizon for uh, the, the prediction of an oceanic. And then you go to, to decades. You do climate change and you do projections for the next century or even thousands of years. You do uh, climatic projections. 
uh, the predictability here is the forcing. The solar forcing is the same all the time. The natural forcing is a noise, but you have the forcing of the anthropogenic emissions. We are burning uh, uh, fossil fuels, and we are putting CO2 in the atmosphere in, in big uh, amounts, and uh, you can suppose, you can assume, under certain scenarios, how this, this uh, concentration of, uh, of CO2, for instance, in the atmosphere, will how this concentration will be in the future. You can you can assume a, a given scenario. So this scenario is a forcing to your system and the predictability there comes from the external forcing. Okay? You are not here, you are not saying that in 2020 the first of January will happen what what is even here. It's not that way. You average uh, in a climatic sense a period of 30 years, a decade, the conditions and you see whether the situation is warmer or colder than the previous one, things like that. Okay? So, <coughs> uh, what about the ensemble, ensemble forecasting? So we have the models and we know that the model can be used in a predictive or a projective way. Okay, let's think of the predictive way. We do, we do short or medium range weather forecast or we do seasonal forecast with our thermic model. We can do both things. In, in this case, <laughs> the initial condition plays an important role, plays the main role, because the, the system is non-linear. And the time horizon, the, 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 the prediction horizon, uh, will be longer or shorter depending on the weather conditions. The, the atmosphere is not uh, stationary. So you have uh, periods where the prediction can be uh, more accurate in a longer time, but other situations much more unstable for the prediction phase after two days. So the range of, uh, of the forecast horizon is so dependent. So uh, what uh, the, uh, after so, 20 years, a couple of decades ago, the meteorological climate community start, started thinking on that. And in order to estimate this uncertainty, they started to perturb the initial conditions. So they don't do one prediction, they do several from different initial conditions and then and they analyze what, what happens in the future. So this is the idea of ensemble forecasting. It's nothing, it's, for us it's very simple stuff. Okay? But the first time they applied operationally this idea in the European Center for Medium Weather Forecast, which is a big European institute for these uh, weather uh, problems, the first time they, they uh, applied this idea operationally uh, successfully was in this case. This is the Lothar cyclone which happened on December 99. It, it was a big uh, cyclone in Central Europe with uh, typical figures of uh, very big host, uh, hazards, extreme hazards. Uh, 100 people dying and so on. <coughs> so, this is the, this is the this is the Gulf of the Gulf of Biscay. So this is England. In order, so you have an idea of the spatial scale. Okay, this is Central Europe. This is the initial condition they used in the deterministic forecast. So the, the conventional forecast is running the system just once from the be, uh, from the best case, the initial condition, the analysis to put all the observations and have the the best. Uh, uh, estimated state for the atmosphere. And this is uh, in another variable. Imagine this is uh, sea level pressure, uh, contours. Okay? So <coughs> uh, you put this uh, initial condition, you run the system, it, and 20, almost 42 hours is uh, almost two days later, you, you have this prediction. This prediction, this is the verification, this is what happened two days before, uh, two days after, sorry. This is the big uh, cyclone here, and you didn't pick that uh, structure in the prediction. So you failed. Failed very, very badly. Because you don't even see any cyclone. So it's a dramatic failure for, for such a, an operational institute. But fortunately, at that time, they had in place 
this ensemble for gasket system. So they didn't run just one initial condition, but, but 50. And if you see here, there are slight differences between this. You see here, you don't have this point here. They are almost negligible perturbations. Okay? And they run these 50 conditions and they got this situation. So they started to do probabilistic forecasting. Okay? Even at, in a two days uh, horizon. And you are picking here the cyclone many times. So at least you have a warning of, of extreme hazard happening in two days. It's very successful. You go for a dramatic failure to a very successful prediction with this idea. Okay. So this is uh, this is the state of nonlinear systems in, in in this topic. Okay. You put initial conditions and analyze the evolution. And uh, some work was done in the type of, of initial condition on the, in the type of perturbation sorry that you, you have to put random with some structure lacked perturbations. This is the the state of the system for scale, but from a previous time, things like that, a lot of stuff. So the, the prediction <coughs> that would go to the media would be, let's say, 40% the probability of cyclone? No. 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 In the media, probability is not a, an allowed word. <laughs> <laughs> so how is this presented? Because some, in, in some of the, uh, of the examples, it may happen. It may start. It may yeah. happen or not that a big storm will will tell you... Will is you know, but in, but in, the, in the US, I mean, I remember, yeah. that they said uh, uh, showers, <coughs> 50%, yeah, yeah. Percent or... Nowadays, nowadays, probabilistic uh, prediction is coming into the news. For instance, mm -hmm. notice uh, this Easter, not the previous Easter, in the TV1, uh, I don't remember the name of the, the weather lady, this, uh, Okay, see, she, she just put this, these pictures. So she said, this is the situation, we can have a very nice Easter or a very awful Easter. You decide, I cannot. I guess there is some possible validation afterwards. I mean, yes, you can yes. say, there's a 30% chance of rain tomorrow. Yeah. And then you check how many times did rain tomorrow. Yeah, it's is all it close to 30% or is... Yeah, yeah, it's the reliability. If you give a probability of occurrence, there's a test of your probabilistic yeah. prediction. Yeah. And does, yes. does it work? The test? The, yes. If you look at the scores that they that they obtain, the, the prediction is good. But you, you you always have the uncertainty in the prediction. So you, in average, you are successful. But uh, in average, so tomorrow it may be failure. <laughs> that is. This, this is the problem of communication, which is not the problem of, of the talk. It's just to give you an idea of why this spatiotemporal analysis is important here, in order to understand this. No, because uh, question I was going to it could be sometimes that these 50 forecasts are very equivalent, they are almost the same, right? Yes, it's also possible. Most, very most of the times. Yeah. It happens from time to time that you have two, two non overlapping groups. So they. They, they do, mm, the, the, the forecast is based on, on a, an, a deep analysis of this. They do a clustering of this, assign probabilities, validate, the, there is a lot of people working on that. So uh, it's just the, the basic idea regarding the, sp the spatial temporal thing. Not the, they, use, they make a very good use of all the information they have. And they produce very good, uh, most of the, of the validation scores that uh, we use, come from the meteorological world because they need to have very precise and accurate the validation scores of the different sources of errors and so on so forth. Okay, so if we take <coughs> these predictions and put them in this MVL diagram, this is M, this is V, uh, it's a different nomenclature. This is what we, what, what we have. <coughs> if we take the medium range uh, forecast, 10 days, we consider many initial conditions, many days, and average. Okay, and the symbol we we compare the the, the control or the trajectory against the perturbed ones. 
for us, this is the, the error, the growth. The perturbation which grows and transforms in error. Okay? If, you, if you do that <coughs> with the model from the European or the American uh, uh, sites, then we have a big model in Europe and there is a big model in, in the States. If you do that, this is this open uh, circle and this is this cross. And you have different characteristics here and there. They start with a perturbation, which is random, it's not flow uh, assimilated, because it is down here, it's not up there. So we can, we can see many things, many interesting things, just by looking at this diagram. This is the one, two, three, four, five, six, in average, after seven days, it saturates. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven days, it saturates here. So they are using the same amplitude in the perturbation, so they did the same work to, to, to they did a parallel work to obtain which, which one is the optimal amplitude of the perturbation in order to better uh, sample the uncertainty, the real uncertainty we see at the typical forecast horizon. So they did the same kind of analysis because they, they get very similar results. You see more or less there? Yeah, but not at the beginning. <coughs> yeah, but this is, it, this depends on the, on the system. The okay. This, the, the resolution of the European model is, is double the digital resolution of the American. So you have more room to have spatial structure. So uh, many, many things to interpret. This is a model for Europe, for the world? This is a global model. Global. Yeah. These are all global models. And this is a seasonal model, which uh, we have five minutes, ten minutes left. Yeah. Five to ten? Ten minutes left? Ten minutes, yeah. Okay. So if you put a, a seasonal uh, model, so you have predictions for at least 90 days, you see here one, two, three, four, it's a different study. So you are putting the perturbation in the ocean. It, actually, you put the perturbation in the atmosphere. It goes to the ocean, and it evolves in the ocean, and it, it is not very well done, but it's as it works. So, now we go to, uh, we take this seasonal uh, experiment. We are interested in this seasonal scale because most of our activities in this scale, the European projects we are involved in, uh, are at a seasonal scale. Okay. So for us, it's our natural uh, horizon. And what you have here is an ensemble of models. So I told you that the physics is the same for all the models in the world but the parameterizations make the difference. So the Canadian model, the, the, the French model, the German model, the Spanish model, there is no Spanish model, so the, and so on and so forth, they all do their, the, they cook their, their ingredients in a different way. So to sample the uncertainty, not in the initial condition, but in the model, you use an ensemble, you use several models and combine the results, as you use several initial conditions and, and you combine the results. So this is the, <coughs> the Surfax, French, the European, is Europe, is Italian, and so on, models. Each column is a model, this is the atmospheric configuration, the oceanic configuration, and the type of perturbation, how they perturb the initial conditions, because they also perturb the initial conditions. We have nine models, and 20, sorry, 11 different initial conditions per torque from, from a control trajectory in, in all of the cases. So you have 9 times 11, 99 predictions for us, for the single validation time, okay? And uh, let's keep the details of this. Uh, you, you may think that all the models are different, so you can assign uh, equal probabilities to all the models, okay? So, but uh, they are not uh, they are not different because in some cases they share some built-in block. For instance, the atmospheric component. The atmospheric component from the, this model Fairfax and this Meteor France is the same as page. And also from this and this. But also the oceanic component is shared with different versions by four out of the seven, sorry, I said nine, so seven models, okay? 
Uh, this is served by four out of the seven models. So why should assign the same probability to this model and this and this, where this and this are very similar to each other? So they are dependent. They, they are, there is no sense to put equal probability. So a big, uh, a big uh, research topic in meteorology is weighting appropriately the ensemble predictions that we have. So this should have one, uh, one over two, and this should have one over two, and this should have one weight. Okay, in the final prediction but, but, or something, something like that. But one question is: after all these years and, and looking at what the different models that predict and the reality, can one say, well, this model usually works a little bit better than that other one, and we disregard that one, the one that works worse? No, no, I'm not disregarding a model. No, but what you say that, but after, after so many years of making predictions and using all those models, one can arrive at the conclusion that some of them are very good and some of them are pretty bad. And I don't think all, <coughs> all of the nine are equally good in making the prediction. So, so that people consider the fact of yeah, yeah, throwing away some of the models. Yeah, everything is considered. So they consider uh, what we call the they use Bayesian model averaging to weight its model according to the performance. Mm. And this performance is updated every mm. six months or whatever. Mm. They do operationally, they do things like that. But they are not very su successful because a model can be good in Europe but bad in the States and the other way around. So when you try to do something global, uh, things become very messy and difficult. So uh, our point of view is more basic. It's, uh, just if I have models which are repeated, yeah. just don't treat them as independent. as independent. And how can I see that the, these models are repeated? Because they do the same with the perturbations, so they don't add any extra value to the final ensemble. But you have to prove that, because they argue many, many things that you can imagine. Okay? So, uh, these are the building blocks, how this, uh, okay, this information that uh, is not relevant to this case, but this is the performance in the NVL diagram of all the predictions uh, averaged uh, from the different initial conditions, from a particular uh, initialization time, which is the season, and so on. So this is the, the one of the diagrams. And here you can see, this is two meters temperature. And here you can see that they perturb the system using some uh, non-random uh, perturbation because it has the same structure as the system as it evolves. Okay. Uh, it, 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 uh, it loses structure, gains structure, and saturates. It's exactly the same pattern, the same behavior as we oh. saw in the, in the theoretical stuff. But what can we say here? Some models use uh, correlated uh, perturbations structure uh, perturbations and some others do not because these models start here and those and those and so on so this is using a different perturbation than those ones and more than that if we see which <coughs> models are similar here so this is the fingerprint so this model is very different from this one in this diagram and this is very different from this one but the green and the blue are very are very similar <coughs> they do almost the same they start grow and saturate in almost the same point. So these two models, if you look at the components, they share both the atmospheric and the oceanic components. So you don't have two models here, so you have one repeated two times. So there is no there is no way to to use them as dependent. They do that because they follow the dynamics they, they but uh, at least you can say something. Okay? And you can analyze here what is inside this big ensemble in order to better understand uh, different roles. For instance, here you have uh, the, the initial condition has some structure because they perturb the surface of the ocean. The surface of, of the ocean is linked to the temperature of 2 meters. It's directly linked with the temperature of the atmosphere over the ocean. So it, it has the same structure. But if you look at a different variable, this is geopotential at 500 hectopascals. This is something like the pressure at 5,000 meters. 
Okay? The perturbations are random. But up there, you don't see the perturbation on the ground, on the surface. So for you, it's random. It's a numerical noise that it starts growing, following the pattern, but again, it's not very similar. So, so you can analyze variable by variable, level by level, all the stars uh, obtaining similar conclusions. So, there are <coughs> a couple of papers that, no, this model, this is waiting, sorry. This results on the same, same, and same. There are several papers in the, in the web that you can download and see the, the results in detail, but uh, to finish, there is an extension of this idea uh, with this, uh, I don't know why this is so fuzzy, but uh, this is supposed to be the same equation as before mm -hmm. with this coupling term with the y, y, j, i is the, is the high frequency variable that uh, you got with here. X can be seen as the in this case as, as the ocean and Y as the atmosphere or the other way around depending on how you mix the scales. But uh, there is an extension to uh, to a model with two scales that we, we also analyzed uh, discovering interesting things like uh, this uh, going up and down behavior of the slow variable uh, doesn't happen when you have coupling and the fast variable which saturates before affects the dynamics of the of the solar. And this this uh, this is done uh, even even though this variable is saturated at this point, it behaves differently from noise. You cannot just remove the variable, the saturated variable and replace it by noise because it doesn't work here. Yes. You you don't get this secondary peak of structure. Okay? Okay, so this, the conclusion is that uh, <coughs> this diagram is very nice to this NVL. NVL means uh, mean variance of logarithms. You take the mean, temporal mean, you take the variance, the temporal variance, you put the, the logarithms of these two quantities in the diagram, and this, this is the diagram. So very straightforward and simple. Uh, it's a powerful diagnosis and characterization tool in, in meteorology, in particular. And uh, we are working to, to, to apply, but uh, operationally, this, all these uh, findings in this, in this field. So, the idea is uh, taking the results and uh, introducing them to the community. There's 50% of the rates, and uh, the uncertainties there are unavoidable. 
So even if you improve and keep improving the, the observations, which is something that is done, 25% uh, of, the, of the budget in meteorology goes to observational systems. So they keep and keep improving. Imagine the ocean. It is impossible to have a good estimation of the initial state of the ocean. You have hundreds of, of voice uh, in these big systems. Okay, any other question? Senior, Senior? Well, what is the... In, in the case of infinitesimal perturbation of a special temporal chaotic system, there is theory on what is the, the behavior to so the variance and mean value grows, and then the, the mean value uh, continues to grow, and the variance stops at something that the system size. But in the books you have shown also that in, after this, so when the, when the perturbation becomes non infinitesimal, still all the models do more or less the same. There is no theory on that. But about the large deviation, the large uh, perturbation size behavior? You can, there is no general theory or universal no, theory? You can analyze the, the scaling in that case, but it, it, uh, it is very uh, difficult. So you don't have a clear scaling. Uh, for infinitesimal perturbations, you have scaling universalities like KPZ or whatever that uh, do not apply in this case. So this is why we introduce this qualitative uh, diagram uh, in order to uh, there are there are some some uh, uh, the, the the two bro the two situations are, are are always there for non-linear systems. So if it was not uh, intuitive at all that the, the linear the, that the systems will will gain correlation then it will lose correlation and then it will gain correlation again. So this, this behavior uh, in the finite uh, perturbation side uh, was not trivial at all. There was a, a lot of work there to, to characterize that. But uh, there is no precise, uh, precise law, law like in the infinitesimal case. There are um, mostly quantitative, qualitative, sorry. You showed that prediction is usually a weighted average of the different models from the different countries and things like that. And you said also that the models usually work differently well in the different regions. That's, that's why they're being yeah. used. In how far, or what can one learn from uh, knowing about the different weighted averages in the different regions about the better model and how far is that being used or does that find its limitations in national interests? The, it's, uh, <coughs> it's a combination of two things. The, for instance, the European Center focus on Europe, so it is expected to develop a model which is more accurate for Europe, because it knows very well the synaptic conditions, the drivings, and all those things. But at the same time, they validate the model according to Europe, so they introduce changes in the model in order that the model uh, for instance, uh, reproduce, uh, reproduces the uh, temperature and the precipitation in Europe. They focus on that. So when you validate the model uh, independently, the validation is not so independent because they are doing that validation to calibrate the, the, the model. So it's a mixture of, uh, it's difficult to separate which is the effect of the, of the good performance of the model and which, which one is the effect of the adjustment of the model for a particular region. So it's, it's, it's a difficult problem. So uh, you, you, you don't have uh, 80 pro models, 80 pro conditions, and it's a problem to do, to, to, to do something which uh, try to mix theoretically all the information you have. But the fact that you have to change the weights shows that the model is not good yet. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. but it's, uh, there is no trivial, trivial way the way it changes. Because uh, if, you're, if you're focusing on temperature, you have some weights. But if you focus on precipitation, the weights are different. The potential, the vertical structure, the profile, you have thousands of, of variables to look at. And there is no multivariate thing that you can put, to put all together and, and, 
data consensus information or indicator that can give you a valuable information. The, the, the problem there is complexity. Not complexity, sorry. Complexity. It's quantity, quantity. Yeah. yeah. But your last statement implies an assumption, which is that there is a good model. That, that's an assumption. I mean, at, 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 the, at the very theoretical level, there is the question of the limits of predictability. Yeah, but the predictability should work equally well in different regions. Yeah, but you said but no, no, the model no, is not no, 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 good enough. It will be there, will be a good model. The, but the, the model neglects many things. And some things are more important in one place and less important yeah. in another one. That's the problem. Yeah. Models neglect many, many things. Yeah. We validate. GCMs we will validate yeah. models for yeah. the climate in yeah. Spain yeah. In, for that data. No. We have a clear, a clear ranking of which models are good and bad. For Spain, for the situation, and in summer, in winter is different. So this is the detail that you... If we do that, <laughs> that <is different. laughs> And it, there is a reason for that. It's not like the models are random and then one becomes very good and then the other, no. The, the, the models work with you, but you are looking at, at thousand different pieces of, of information. So the ranking of the models need uh, to change necessarily because of uh, tiny details or because of big problems. So they keep improving and improving the models uh, in the light of that information. Sometimes one pick a very big flow of a particular model in the Arctic. It is uh, a clear outlier in that particular index. This model is not. It is revised and. Uh, mm -hmm. So, mm, I think it's, this comes to my mind, which I think is related. So, let's say globally, the system, the atmosphere, the atmosphere, ocean system, or whatever, is in a um, uh, stationary state, I guess, which is a chaotic chaotic regime, isn't it? Is it? Because everything grows. It's chaotic, but it's not a stationary. So, it's like you have changing, uh, you are changing parameters. On the fly. Well, on the, the on, the, on, the, on the geological scales. No, no, in, in daily scale. Daily scale. But daily scale, globally, you are not changing anything. But it, there is no globally here. So you, you cannot analyze in globally the information. Well, at least for the big picture, yeah, you should. So that's the relation you show of the. Of the, the storm track. track. You have the storm yeah. track, the, the storm track in, in winter, but not in summer. So the dynamics of the system have nothing to do in winter and summer. And from week to week, they, they change. So the, there is a driving, which is the sun, which is changing. It, it changes many things, so it's, it's non stationary. It's, uh, it has a standard forcing. And the forcing is not in the, mo in the models? The forcing is not in the models? <coughs> the forcing is, is a constant, yeah, but it's. The, it's the, the, vari the variation of the forcing with the seasons is not in the model. Yeah, it is, it is, it is, it is because it's, it's a constant. But the, the, the dynamics that are changing. Because of that, in the long term, and then like, I was going to ask which is the value of the Lyapunov exponent. So, roughly speaking, so this is the value of the Lyapunov exponent. So, there, there are mm -hmm. thousand positive Lyapunov exponents, uh, Lyapunov exponent, there are hundreds of Lyapunov exponents. It's then, one is, is, is a different. Do I have a couple of minutes? <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you, if you take the, the, the primitive equations, which is the, the dynamical system. You drop the parametric, uh, the parameterization, and you take just the conservation rules, and you solve them at a particular scale, uh, the scale of uh, 100 kilometers per second. Okay. Uh, and if you try to compute the the, the atom of exponents there, is is uh, impossible because the full model is so big that the linearization and all the analysis is uh, very complex. It's a, it's, it's a matter of, of, of quantity, not of complexity. So there are some simplifications of the model, which go from uh, the baroclinic, the baroclinic, uh, the hydrostatic, hydrostatic, and so on and so forth. Uh, if you try to keep the basic nonlinear features that make uh, this chaotic behavior to the atmosphere, at the very end, you, you keep a baroclinic model. It's a baroclinic, very simple, baroclinic. Uh, in that case, uh, you have tens of positive diatomic uh, exponents. But uh, in the full case, um, I, can, I can tell you, but it's not a, a high, it's not a high dimensional chaos. The chaos in the atmosphere, uh, 
comes from the particular processes. For instance, not the, not the horizontal, but the vertical dynamics are the ones that introduce more linearities in the system. There are several prediction centers, or forecast centers. So one there is at the European level, there is another one at the Spanish level, there is another one at the Catalonian level, level. then there is another one at the Catalonian level. But then, but then so, so the point is, is this a standard? I mean, do we know how you do the same? Or doing, doing, and what is the, the size where you, I mean, what, what is the scale? I mean, is, is yeah. the, the scales, the, the centers that have the same, the size determined by the geography or by the politics? Global, global, uh, models, global models are run by big centers. So in Spain, there is no center running a global model. Mm -hmm. So it's the European center, center, Germany, France, and so on, global models. But the global model gives you a prediction with a low resolution, 100 kilometers. And then here we have a second step, it's a post-processing post -processing step. You can couple a high resolution dynamical model, which is cheaper in terms of computational time, and uh, many people do that. For instance, in our group, we run a regional model uh, every day, couple this uh, operational exercise. So this, this uh, high resolution predictions can be done, are done by many people. But uh, when you see the official predictions, most of them rely on the global. Uh, the, the one that the is European. Or European or the NCAR in the States. Or so this, this added value of the high resolution information is... Uh, so, so in between the European and say the regional one, there is still the Spanish forecast as well. No, you can download all the boundary. All the so so, is necessary all these steps? I mean, it's necessary to, I mean, I understand there is a, some very few people run a global model. Yeah. But then on top of that global model, you have to have a, a, a mid-sized prediction for, and then another one at another yeah, scale. Yeah, many, you know, many, what, how many scales do you need for that? Many people do research from the global model. Uh, a few people do research on the global model. Mm. Many people do research post-processing. Mm the global models, either with regional models with the statistics. So in our group we, we do all things yeah, on a research basis. And then you have operational research centers uh, which uh, should be uh, open uh, for a particular application. I mean in Spain you have the Galician, the Basque and the Catalonian regional centers plus the, the Spanish the, the national center. All of them are necessary. No, of course not. <laughs> but uh, as many other things, I, yeah, no. <laughs> I, 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 all research institutes are necessary. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, Jose Manuel is still here for two minutes. <laughs> 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 Continue talking to me in the second floor. Thanks again. <laughs>